Anne and Joseph were lapsed Catholics, meaning they didn't really ascribe to their childhood beliefs, but neither did they think about the religion thing a whole lot. They had been comfortably married for 10 years, enjoying each other's company and raising their two children together when some of Joseph's co-workers convinced him that he needed to be born again. Over the next year, Joseph became more and more involved in an evangelical church and social circle, and his newfound convictions became the center of his life. Old friends drifted away because they found him increasingly judgmental, but Anne still loved him. As she put it, I know who he really is, even on those days when he makes it difficult for me to remember. And even though he couldn't bring her along, in fact, she became more solid in her unbelief, Joseph loved her too. Peter was a devoted Pentecostal minister, a self-described fundamentalist who, together with his wife Elizabeth, accepted the call to teach in a missionary school. Over time, as he watched the school administrators manipulate others for their own gain, Peter began to have questions, first about individual Christian leaders, then about the underlying beliefs to which he had given his life. He continued to believe in God, but in his own way. At first he hid his spiritual evolution from Elizabeth, and when she finally found out, she was heartbroken, convinced that he was going to hell. Yet neither of them believed that divorce was the answer. Rachel met and married Matthew, a fellow army trauma nurse, when both were stationed in Iraq. As they faced daily the suffering caused by the war, Matthew turned to his conservative evangelical faith to get him through, and Rachel lost hers. After they finished their tour of duty, Matthew redoubled his efforts to be a loving, supportive husband, convinced that he could restore Rachel's belief in God and participation in their church. Rachel, on the other hand, was working to make peace with her Iraq experience in other ways. To her, religious explanations for the suffering she had witnessed were unsatisfying, and she found it painful that Matthew was trying so hard. Because I write for former Christians, stories like these cross my desk, along with requests for advice. Even the most solid marriage can be shaken when one partner loses his or her faith, especially in a tight community that emphasizes belief as the means to salvation, as many variants of Christianity do. When two people find themselves unexpectedly in a mixed marriage, one a believer and one a former believer, the partner who believes may feel distressed or frightened or personally responsible for healing the one who has become a skeptic. Faced with pressures like these, some couples end up going separate ways, and yet others stay together finding ways to enjoy each other despite their differences. If you are a former believer, now, quote, unequally yoked with a devout but devoted spouse, what can you do to help your partnership through the crisis? Here are a few points worth considering. Speak for yourself. When you talk about your former beliefs or about the quandaries created by your deconversion, use I statements. I just can't make myself believe that anymore. I feel uncomfortable in situations where people keep trying to reconvert me. You statements often put other people on the defensive. When we stick with I statements, especially I feel statements, it is hard for other people to argue. Are they really going to insist that they know best how you feel? It is also less likely that they will feel attacked when your focus is inward rather than outward. Quash false hope. Although it may seem cruel, it is helpful in the long run if you avoid cultivating false hope for your salvation. When the topic of your unbelief comes up, remember that your partner may be feeling anxious and upset, even desperate to persuade you, and waffling on your part can prolong those feelings. As long as your partner thinks you may reconvert, he or she likely will feel some obligation to help that happen at least if the belief system in question is at all evangelical. To quote Anne again, Because I'm a naturally calm, soft-spoken, don't-rock-the-boat kind of person, Joseph took my easygoingness as permission for him to preach to me. It took a long time for me to convince him that his preaching was hurting our marriage. If you are a parent or a teacher, you've probably had 
a fair bit of practice being kind but firm in the face of another person's distress. The same skill set applies. Talk from the heart. I have never met a former Christian who deconverted without some deep soul searching. Of necessity, a free thinking worldview is built on your core values, including your moral values. And one of the most personal and powerful critiques of Christianity comes from those values. If your spouse probes your loss of faith, speak from your core rather than from your head. I can't imagine being blissfully happy in heaven when other people are being tortured. I don't ever want to be capable of that. Approaching the conversation from the standpoint of your core values is powerful in part because most religion teaches that if you are an apostate, then you have no basis for morality. Of course, we all do. Request a little research. It may be reasonable, even respectful, for you at some point to ask your spouse to do some reading about the beliefs you once shared. Partnership is a delicate balance of recognizing our differences, loving and respecting each other where we are at, and in small doses, nudging each other to grow. Asking your partner to do some reading can serve any of these three. Be honest with yourself about whether you're seeking understanding from your partner or spiritual change. Then, choose materials on the less threatening end of the spectrum and ask your partner to read them as a part of caretaking your relationship. Remind him of the research that you two would do if one of you were changing careers or choosing an oncologist or any other decision that affected you both in a major way. Confine conflict. If arguments about religion are intruding on your other activities, or if avoided topics are hanging over you, think about scheduling some time to talk about religion once a week when you're not tired and pressured so that you can leave the wound alone at other times. You also may need to schedule time to talk about practical concerns like co-parenting, don't be afraid to make religion an off-limits topic when you know it's likely to just create tension. Say something like, It makes me sad when we keep having the same conversation because I worry that it just wears away at our relationship. Or, I feel too tired and crabby to talk about this right now. Can we talk about it in the morning? Not all processing is fruitful. Give affirmation. The Seattle atheists have a tagline Quote, we believe in you. If you are trying to stay with your spouse despite religious differences, I would guess that you believe in him or her deeply and in the values you share. That is a message worth repeating over and over when opportunities arise. With a touch, with a look, or with words. It's something you can't say too often. Expand your social circle. With your partner, cultivate some friendships that aren't all religious insiders. Any rift in your relationship is likely to seem bigger if your spouse is embedded in a purely sectarian social context. Churches often give covert and even overt messages that outsiders are unethical or unsafe. If your spouse associates exclusively with people who mistrust outsiders, he or she may lose track of the fact that you are you. A thoughtful, decent human being who has been a lover and a soulmate. If frightened, judgmental family members or church members are making it impossible to connect on this level, think about a vacation together. Live in your common ground. All relationships succeed by focusing on common ground, and despite what Hollywood tells us, no two people can or should be perfectly fused. Imagine a Venn diagram with overlapping circles representing you and your friends, including your spouse. It might even be helpful to draw this. Each relationship is the shared area between two circles. Sometimes the people in your life can relate to such different parts of you that they have almost nothing in common with each other. A healthy marriage is built on overlap, whatever it may be. Teamwork in the tasks of life, good sex, a hobby, common dreams loving the same kids, a desire to see each other flourish. The possibilities are wide. After three decades of mixed marriage, Peter and Elizabeth say, enjoying all the things we do have in common makes it all worthwhile. Shared religious belief, 
is just one of many possible points of contact. Go with what you've got. Lastly, trust your journey. Your path is your own. Trust your growth process whether or not your spouse comes along. Anne described it this way, Through this process with Joseph, I grew in many ways. Mostly, I learned that it is perfectly fine for me to be my own best friend. I don't need Joe's approval, or anyone else's, to feel okay about myself and my outlook on life. Along the way, don't forget to laugh. Your ability to laugh at yourself, especially at the fine stew you've created, is one of your best allies. When you and your partner can laugh about it together, you're home.